Two, one. You are live, you are live. Morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to the somewhat brighter sunrise fire than I'm everyone. used to. Good morning, and welcome I was to just the looking into the top of the sunrise fire than I'm used to. For used to, therein used to live a family or I was just looking of into the top of the termite mound. Five of them. For therein the used to live a family or sounder of or two sows of and about three or five of them. Three little ones that used to live in that hole. And there's no fresh evidence of them, so I'm three assuming that they have three moved on used to live in that or hole. been eaten by something. There's no fresh evidence of them facing due east now. Um, and it's quite misty, but it's not too cold, about 12 degrees Celsius, which if I'm not mistaken puts us at roughly 65 degrees Fahrenheit. I should remember that as I've been told it twice today, but I've forgotten. During the course of the night, Chris Rogue, thank you, uh, you pointed out, uh, and Joanne, you pointed out that there was a leopard calling from just south of um, the Jumadam camp. Brent is following up in that area, so thank you very much for that. For those of you who don't know, my name is James, and on camera today is Viam. Hello, Viam. You can see Viam has got some very beautiful uh, blue gloves on uh, because it's, well, it's quite chilly if you're driving around here on an open Land Rover. On the other vehicle, as I mentioned, the inimitable Brent Leo Smith being filmed by the uh, dreadlocked Jandre and a new addition to the camera team, Zander, who um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term hipster. Zander is basically a hipster. He has a very, very impressive beard. Uh, in the final control today, Kirsten McLennan-Smith back on the vocals and uh, tapping away at the keys we have got... Who was it? Was it Rebecca? Or was it Jerry? It's Jerry, I think. I think I heard her up this... Oh, it's Chelsea Byrne. Chelsea Byrne. So, please talk to us. We are completely live. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. You can ask us anything about what we're seeing. Ask us about the animals that you might see if you happen to be a new viewer. Or, if you're wanting to travel to Africa, well, you're more than welcome to ask us about that too. Because we'd love to have you here. There we go. It is only through tourism, or it's largely through tourism, that many of our Africa's great conservation areas will be maintained as conservation areas. So if you're thinking about coming out here and you are worried about some of the things you've heard about disease and war and famine and all the dreadful things you hear about Africa, most of which are utter nonsense, then do ask us some questions. It's a perfectly safe, brilliant place to come on holiday. My plan this morning is to head east. Well, I mean, don't have much choice when you're on a road that only heads east or west. I'm going to go towards where the Nkuhuma Pride and their five cubs had that buffalo kill with the four Birmingham boys yesterday evening. We'll see if we can't find them. Good idea? Okay. Off we go. Viem, you have not seen the lions since you've been back? No. no. Viem's, any cats. Yeah, Viem has not seen any cats since he's been back. He has only done, of course, one drive as have I. And it's amazing how much brighter it is than it was when we left, of course. When we left uh, two weeks ago, in Viem's case 19 days ago, um, it was still dark as we, well, it was, was dark as we drove out. It was light enough to start the show without lights, but now you can see it really has changed. It's amazing how it happens. Let's head across to Brent, find out what he's going to do this morning. I'm going to hie my way into the rising sun to find the lions. Is it African Dawn? Um, we have Jean Ray on camera, and for the first time, we have a real live hipster on Safari Live. So everyone meet Zander, the latest member of the team. And hipster beard, hipster beanie. We never see. Oh, I need my binoculars. <laughs> there we go. We always make new videos. After the morning, is that I'm again checking around the edge of the Mawati River. This is uh, turning into something of a pattern yesterday. Wendy was very recalcitrant yesterday afternoon. Anyway, I hope she, she will improve. Brent is in a fairly difficult signal area looking for Karula, so with any luck he'll find her and some signal at the same time. Now, 
you may be able to see the pinkening sky. And I always quite like this time of the year because, well, it's now the 1st of August, of course, Women's Month, as far as I'm aware, certainly here in South Africa. We have two public holidays this month. One on Wednesday, we have a very large local government election. Uh, don't worry, we will still take our safari. And then also the 9th of August, of course, is Women's Day in South Africa, a massively important day in South Africa. Uh, I'm trying to remember why I was telling you that. Oh, yes, I now remember. Because it's August, which means that we're heading sort of towards the springtime, I love tracking the sun as it moves slowly towards the sort of southeast. So if we are facing due east, that's a lovely noise, Viam, from this engine. Uh, not the engine, the brakes. That's due east there, right? You can see the pinkening sky to the left. That's where the sun's coming up, so that's just slightly north of east. By the time the sun actually does come up in the middle of summer, that will be on the 22nd of December, it will be way to the right-hand side of your picture. Those are Impala, I think you can just see scuttling about on the road in the far distance. And it's so wonderful watching the sun track slowly to the south as we come towards the expectation of spring. I do hope that we're going to have a bit more rain this summer, otherwise it's going to be a bit painful. I've really enjoyed having some winter cool this year. But it, as we all know, I think every single human being I've ever known finds the, um, the prospect of the new life of spring just particularly exciting. Not so, Viam. Viam is overwhelmed with excitement, as you can hear from his extremely exuberant voice. I wasn't really listening. <laughs> he says he wasn't really listening. I think he does switch off a bit when I speak, which is distressing, of course. I feel he could learn so much from me. The other little character I'd really quite like to see is Sundile, but I'm not sure where he is at the moment. Right, Brent is going to try again. Let's head back across to him and get a plan from him. Well, it looks like the gremlins are out in force in Wendy, and don't worry, Viam and Connor will take out their gremlin zappers after the sunrise safari and hopefully zap the gremlins away. So, just in case you didn't hear, we're checking now along the edge of the Mawati River system looking for Queen Karula, uh, the dominant female leopard on Juma, and uh, Herbie's somewhere in the bush on foot, seeing who you can find her. But so far, not a track. And remember, we're on a live African safari, so you are able to ask us live, what we're seeing live, just reiterate the live fact, and you can do that by popping an email to, to us, questions at wildearth.tv, or use the hashtag safari live on Twitter. So I was about to, that's what I was doing when the gremlins struck. I was about to thank uh, Chris Rogue and others who said that they heard leopard sawing on the Juma cam, as well as possibly the sounds of leopards mating. So I'm going to slowly check. I've come from the, the south and I'm checking back to around the Juma cam. Look, we have found, a, found another creature on foot. It is our first animal of the sunrise safari and it is a, a very important animal. It's Herbie! So we're wondering where Herbie was walking, now we know. Morning Herb. Good morning, Bert. Any luck? No luck yet. No luck yet. Okay, I'm gonna keep going Twin Dams towards Vertella. Uh, okay. Which, did you come down? Yeah. Okay. No sign. No sign. Perfect. Okay, so there we go. What Herbie says he's going to head down to the Shkava, which is the Mawati, uh, which is the Shangan word for a little drainage system or, or, or creek, dry creek. And we're going to see if he can find any sign of Kula and those cubs. We're going to go keep checking along the edge to make sure they don't pop out to the side. Cheers, Herb. Good luck. Enjoy. Oh, 
look at that. Popping up the eastern horizon is uh, the burning orb we call the sun. Look at that, isn't that absolutely gorgeous? I really enjoy these winter's mornings. Bit of mist. Some great sunrises and sunsets at the moment. You can hear the dawn chorus, all the birds starting to wake up. Okay. Let's keep moving now. So, a very big safari live welcome to Mr. Fire Sky. There's a name I don't recognize. So, welcome on the live African safari. Uh, Mr. Fire Sky is wondering do we have tigers in Africa? Uh, we do not have any naturally occurring tigers in Africa. And uh, they are from India through the east all the way to Russia. Uh, we unfortunately don't. So, we've got other big cats. We have lions, leopards, and cheetahs. Oh, big cats, so no tigers for us. And uh, one thing I do hope to do one day in my life is to go track a tiger on foot in India. Wouldn't that be exciting? Okay. So, when we found Karula and the cubs on foot, we followed her tracks from here down into the riverbed. And we're lucky enough to spot her in a tree with an impala killed. Now, wouldn't that be nice if we can replicate that today? Always check carefully around these little river crossings. It's a good spot to keep cubs. Lots of timbuity thickets, lots of trees for them to hide in. Okay, well, let's jump back on board and see what James is up to. Everyone, we're just trying to go into the lion sighting, but I am... <laughs> I seem to have... I seem to have maybe missed the turn off. Hang on one second. I wasn't concentrating... Oh, here we go. Phew. I wasn't concentrating particularly hard as we came across here. We had a very nice sighting of the, um, of the Biffleshook Dam and the sunrise. Now, just look at this tree up ahead here. This is unbelievable. Look at that. <laughs> Just try and count all those welchers there. Gee whiskers. That is many. Many, many welchers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty, twenty. I get twenty two vultures there. How many you got, Vim? You didn't count them. That really is quite impressive. Vim, now we spoke about this before we went on leave, and your need to show me taking embarrassing photographs is distressing and needs to stop. Are you working on my confidence, are you? Thank you. Have one more look at the vultures, 22, I think. All of them, I think, are white-backed. And they all came in late in the evening yesterday, and they'll be patiently waiting for the lions to leave. Okay, let's go and have a look-see if the lions are here, and hopefully the little cubs playing as the dawn takes hold. On the 1st of August, the year 2016.
Just watch out there, everybody. That uh, VM will move the knob thorn so it doesn't hit you in the face. Thank you, VM. I can see one lion feeding on the carcass. Thank you, Dory, in South Carolina. You say you also counted 22 harbingers of death hanging on that tree there. It really is quite impressive. And I tell you, when the sun comes out onto that tree, it's going to be even more impressive. And cubs, little baby lions. And vultures and lionesses and all manner of great joy. I'm going to go around the side here because I think that's going to give us a better view of everyone. And here come two more lions. Now, let's just park up on the little hill here and then we'll get a nice stick stuff. How's that, Vimpy? Will that work for you? You quite like these cats, don't you, Vim? Right, that is the scene that we are looking at. Every First of all, let's go from the ugliest to the prettiest. The uh, buffalo um, is dead. You can see that very clearly no longer with us and has been skinned very neatly and they're now onto the rib cage. Now, it's those bits and pieces in between the ribs that the vultures are going to be largely eating. Then, <laughs> now these two are still growling at each other over there. I'm sure they're mating or thinking about mating, but there's still that growling that they were doing yesterday. I'm sure they fed during the night. Look at them there in the sun, isn't that beautiful? That's stunning. Hello Sandy, while we watch what seems to be a courtship display going on there, you say, when, if any of these cubs are male, which uh, is highly likely given that there are five of them and three others, um, will they stay with the Birmingham boys when they grow up or will they go off? Um, no, Sandy, they'll have to leave. They will definitely be excluded from the territory by the Birmingham boys when they're about two and a half to three years old. I said there were five cubs here. But I only see three of them now, and I wonder if the other mother hasn't taken the other two away. I don't know where she would have gone. She might just be up on the bank. We'll keep an eye out around here. Look at them now playing. This is just the best now, of course. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> Just listen to all the noises. <laughs> look up as the vultures fly over. Now we were asked very astutely yesterday why it is that hyena cubs will approach a vehicle and lion cubs and leopard cubs won't. And when we, I was originally asked 
why leopard cubs wouldn't, I said, because they're not nearly as confident as hyena cubs. Um, but the lions don't approach the vehicle in the same way either, and I haven't come up with any reason as to why that should be the case. And then the other thing, just to keep you posted on yesterday, we were asked was about the vertical slit pupils versus round pupils in cats. And Judy H. very kindly sent me a wonderful article that I read this morning about the different pupil shapes in cats and, and other animals. Um, but it didn't really... It, it's definitely got to do with their feeding strategy. I'm just trying to figure out the difference between the round pupils and the slit pupils of different sized cats. Isn't that amazing to watch? And you can hear their little voices already quite big. Listen to that. Shamsan, a nice one from you about whether or not lion cubs Fleming grimace. Um, don't think I've seen lion cubs Fleming grimacing, Shamsan. I mean, I suppose they would. The Fleming grimace, for those of you who don't know everybody, is that grimace that they make, that many animals make. Um, from horses to, I imagine, some dogs do it, just not as obviously. Uh, but the cats especially, they, when they lift their top lips and lift the soft palate in order to expose a track that leads to an organ called the organ of Jacobson, and that helps them to interpret it, our olfactory signals. So to interpret uh, pheromones and hormones that they essentially will be used, well, one of the things it's used for is when a male is trying to check if a female is ready to mate or not. Um, but that's not the only thing that they use them for. So Shamsan, you know, young cubs like this, I imagine, will be using the organ of Jacobson in order to uh, interpret various smells and other olfactory signals. Um, and I'm pretty sure that they would use the organ of Jacobson for that, and so they would Fleming grimace. And there's this big lion enjoying his meal. Buffalo, of course, did not have a very good Saturday evening. And Anna Marie, you worried about one of the cubs' legs? Apparently, it was limping. I have to confess to you, I didn't notice it. Did you, Vim? Yes. Which one was it? Uh, I don't know. The one that walked down here? No. It was the one that came closest oh. to the, the, the kill. Um, Anna Marie, I don't know. Apparently one of them took a bit of a swat, I think, at the kill two days ago and it wasn't looking very good, so I'm going to assume it's that one. Um, I assume it's probably an injury from being hit by one of the adults when it got too close to the kill while they were eating. I don't know that for sure, but I think that's probably what's happened. Um, um, is it disastrous? Is it going to be detrimental to its health? I don't know. I don't think so. I think you'll find that they it will probably recover. But that said, I have seen prides leave cubs behind when they are injured and they're unable to keep up. So let's just hope that it heals sufficiently while they're sitting here eating this buffalo that it can keep up with them when they decide to move on. And Roger, you were asking if cubs that age overcome injuries like that. Yes, most of the time they do, Roger. And I mean, I think the big thing to remember, um, or to, to consider, Roger, is that when you, when you think about how easily babies overcome injuries compared with adults, I think it would be very similar for the lions and for indeed for any other kind of predator. 
Yeah, on a scale of one to ten, how pleasant would you rate, rate the smell around here? Mm, what is worse? Ten. A ten is, no, ten is good. Mm. Ten is sort of roses, if you like. Uh, not that bad, so I'd give it a six. You give it a six. Mm. I think it's pretty bad. Vian? <laughs> Stop doing that. <laughs> So, the question is, where is the other lioness gone now, with her two cubs? Ginny, very good one from you about whether or not the cubs are eating meat yet. And I think you'll find that they're trying to eat meat. I suspect that's why one of them got thumped. Um, when this, you know, sometime during the course of Saturday evening. Uh, so they will be trying to eat meat, but they obviously they're still suckling. You can see, see them suckling now. And they will suckle until they're about, um, if I'm not mistaken, six months old. Because lions, I always remember six, six, six. Six days until they open their eyes. Six weeks until they're introduced to the pride. Six months until they wean completely. It's got nothing to do with the uh, mark of the devil or anything like that. I just remember that. Find that found that an easy way of remembering. Just scanning the top bank there for the other lioness, but I don't see her there. Robin, in Wisconsin, you're wondering about the sexes of the cubs and if it's possible to tell their sexes at this stage. Robin, it probably is if we got a good enough look at their, behind their tails, yes, it's quite possible we'd be able to tell the sexes, but it would have to be a pretty good look. Um, they're not very obviously, it's not obvious, you can see the testicles uh, uh, on, on young males in the same way that you can see them on uh, young, or young dogs, I guess, but it's not very obvious. So you do, you know, a little flick of the tail you're not going to see. But we, we could tell, with, for example, with, the, with Karula's two cubs, we could tell one male, one female. Well, I mean, the first time we saw them. Just about, not quite, but just about. And that's just because we've got a good look behind the tail. This is so sweet. Well, he's not so sweet. It's difficult to believe that that fellow we're looking at now could ever have been the same as the little thing that's suckling now from his mum. <laughs> I don't know that that's a male, I'm just guessing. Males and females look exactly the same at that age. Ah, now Joel, a very nice question from you. You say, how come the Birmingham boys don't kill the cubs? Well, Joel, um, no, your, your guess is do they all think that they're the fathers? No, I don't think so. Um, maybe genetically they do. Um, but what it is is that even though in a coalition like this, all the, the males are in fact related. And that means that even though one of them or most of them are not fathers just yet, of these particular ones, they might be of the Styx pride or indeed of um, the other litters within this pride, but there's only probably one father for this litter. This litter still carries the genetic legacy of all members of the coalition because they are related. And so, that's a lot of Egyptian geese you can hear screaming, everyone. So, although they're not directly related, they're not directly the father. So let's say this fellow is not the father here. He's definitely at least an uncle. And so these cubs still carry his genetic legacy, even if it's quite a small one. So that's why they don't kill them. Whether that's a, I don't believe it's a conscious thing. Um, I think it's just part of the instincts of how they operate in a pride like this. And uh, I think you know, it's not obvious in this coalition of four whether there's any kind of dominance hierarchy. You'll read in some of the books that there isn't a dominance hierarchy. 
certainly amongst hairy belly matimba and ginger matimba, you know, the two males that were forced to skedaddle from this area by the Birmingham boys, it seemed fairly obvious that hairy belly was slightly larger and probably more dominant because he seemed to have more testosterone in him, he had a blacker mane. If those two males, which and they were, relate, or, and they are related, it's highly likely that Ginger um, had far fewer cubs than Harry Betty did, but he still would have protected those cubs. All right, let's go across to Brent and get an update from him. I am not going anywhere. Well, we've decided to come up to the high ground to see if there's less gremlins living at altitude. So we are now on the northern edge of our traverse area. And I'm just making sure that there are no leopard tracks up here. Now, we did have those young male leopard tracks around the gate yesterday. And I think they could be young Sindile. Now, we're going to slowly meander because without having a set territory, you could easily pop back for a visit to Juma. So we're going to just zigzag through this area. So we've come up Gallagher Shortcuts, we'll do Aubrey's Road, then we'll do Sandy Patch, and then round to the gate. Hoping to find any sign of a leopard. Hi, Sandy. Uh, Sandy says she used to see Tingana on the live safaris. Now we see Mvula. Has Mvula taken over Tingana's territory? The other way around, I'm afraid, Sandy. So Mvula has lost his territory to Tingana. Mvula is now what we would call a, not a dispersed male. He's, he's already dispersed as a youngster. Um, he's now a nomadic male. So he's because Tingana seems to have been having some argument with a leopard down in the south. He's been spending more time on that boundary, and Vula's taking advantage of that. But he's staying in a very, very s small, finite area here in the north. Uh, so more in Buffers Hook, Manuleti. So he's actually stuck between Tingana and uh, Gajima. And Gajima has given him a good hiding recently. So he'll try to avoid all those other dominant male leopards. Uh, that's Vula. Uh, just to make sure he doesn't get too badly injured. But... If the opportunity to mate arises and the opportunity to sow his genetic or extend his genetic line further, he will definitely take that opportunity. And we saw that happen with the Shaluva 2005 female. Okay. So we're going to keep checking for tracks. Hopefully, we're going to find some shortly, or Herbie's going to have some success. Uh, in the Mawati, while we do that, I uh, will not keep you away from Commander Bond and the Cubs. Right, well, we're back, everybody, and just look at the lioness there. Possibly the consort of the Birmingham boy just behind the bushes, and she's enjoying the view of the sun. The rays haven't quite touched her yet because she's still in the shade. Just listen to the sounds also all around us, apart from the crunching of um, bone and uh, sinew. Just listen to the sounds. I'm going to be quiet for a little while. dawn chorus. You can hear the long billed crombex going. Plenty of white brown scrub robins, doves, cake turtle doves, or ring neck doves calling all the way down the valley. And vultures, you can just hear their wings beating, flying through the air as they sort of change trees, squabble with each other, and wait patiently in the trees. And yesterday we were treated to the absolutely disgusting sight of um, some hooded vultures eating lion dung, which uh, was uh, offensive to say the least. 
But those big vultures that we saw earlier today, the whiteback, they're waiting for meat. Look at this. This is quite nice to see. Interesting that she's stayed away. She stayed away from the kill while he was eating, and now he's marking his territory slightly. I say slightly because, well, he's kind of at a kill site. Hello, James and Springs. Very good to hear from you, from close to Johannesburg. Um, I'm sure it's a lot colder in Springs than it is here. I know it was about two and a half degrees when I drove through there yesterday, which was very cold. James, you want to know how long these lions are going to stay with the kill until it's finished, James, and I would put that probably at around about the end of today. There's not a huge amount of meat left on this carcass now, so I think by the end of today they'll be done here. And they'll probably lie here until this evening, regardless, because, well, they're full and they've, you know, got nowhere better to be right now. They might move to the dam to have some water. And then I think by either late this afternoon or tomorrow morning, the vultures will descend here and finish off what's left of this buffalo. No hyena here. I'm not surprised about that because there are four male lions in and around this area and hyenas are going to think well, more than twice before they come to take on a coalition of lions like this. And Kathy, you say, are the birds so noisy because of the lions? No, not at all. Um, they're, they're not actually that many calling around where we're sitting. Many of them are quite a long way from here, but because we're sitting down in a depression and the air is still quite thick with the evening, um, you'll find that uh, the sound echoes up through the valley. I also think that the wind, the rain that we had, the sort of 20 millimeters of rain or so that we had, has made a big difference to the amount of bird activity that there was, or that there is. Certainly they seem to be a lot louder than they were when I left. Just looking behind there, VMP, those lions are moving. He's definitely testing whether she's prepared to mate or not. They've been doing this for at least, well, I mean, certainly all night. Now, just watch, if you want to know what a Fleming grimace is, you may well get a view of it now. There we go. He's now, of course, he's doing it, but he's got his back to us, so you can't really see. So he's sniffing her urine, and he's testing to see whether she's ready to mate or not. And clearly she's either just about to go into estrus or she is in estrus. And this kind of courtship display is the precursor to some fairly aggressive mating that will take place. You can hear a woodland kingfisher going. <whistles> Pity for you! Pity for you! Perhaps he's talking to the lion because the lion is clearly having his advances not required at the moment. Pity for you! Pity for you! What a stunning way to spend a Monday morning. It's tough out here on Monday mornings, isn't it, Vian? Mm -hmm. Yep. Makes you wish you were in the traffic, doesn't it? On your way to some legal firm, perhaps, to read some contracts between two companies. Wouldn't you rather be doing that now? I'd rather be a broker. Or, bro or a broker, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then you would have gotten to work a lot earlier. We'll do it from the PC. Mm. Or from your PC, yes. 
really tough that we have to be here instead. Hello, Iretus Fox. I don't think I've heard from you for a little while. Lovely to hear from you again. Uh, you say, why do the lions leave the rib cage intact? Why don't they tear it apart? Um, it's not so much a conscious decision. I think it's because the sinew and mus musculature and the cartilage in between those ribs holds it, the ribs together. And so you can see there, maybe you can see there, the bottom of the rib cage has been eaten away. It has been chewed away there. And I think it's just a question of what's easier. So I read as Fox, I think it's easier for them to get into the belly there without trying to pull apart those um, very strong sinews on the rib cage. And so they just kind of leave it there. It's easy, they, they pull all, everything out the middle and they'll eat that pretty much in the sand. And then they go and they eat the flesh off the legs. And the rib cage is normally the last thing to be taken apart because it doesn't have that much meat on it and it's obviously held together by that sinew. You know, the sun is just now starting to... Oh, I can hear some hyenas calling. There are hyenas calling, not well, quite a long way from here. Vultures all over the place, everyone. They're flying from tree to tree. They're obviously getting a little impatient and one or two hooded vultures have landed on the ground now and are resuming their clearing up of the elephant dung. And not the elephant, the lion dung, which is very kind of them to do because it does smell very evil. Now, Quincy, you're wondering about a lion's tongue and you want to know if it's rough and do they use it to sort of clear off the, to, um, clear off the meat? Yes, they are able to take meat off the bones with the tongue. Uh, with force over the top of your head, uh, quite possibly um, take the skin off your skull. So they do have very coarse tongues, and it certainly is used to some extent to clear away the area that they want to eat. and they squeeze the gut contents out and then eat the intestines. So the intestines are good eating.
Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our in So unfortunately, we experienced some tech difficulties. That's one of the things about being alive and in the bush. But our tech crew.
Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our engineering department and our tech department will be working on it, getting us back up and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world. But we will be back up and stick with us, because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you. So unfortunately we experienced some tech difficulties. That's one of the things about being alive and in the bush. But our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions behind me. Hopefully we'll be back with you shortly. Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our engineering department and our tech department will be working on it, getting us back up and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world. But we will be back up and stick with us, because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you.
So unfortunately, we experienced some tech difficulties. That's one of the things about being alive and in the bush. But our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions behind me. Hopefully, we'll be back with you shortly. Sorry about this everybody, perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around madly trying to fix it and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our engineering department and our tech department will be working on getting us back up and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world. But we will be back up and stick with us, because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you. So unfortunately we experienced some tech difficulties, that's one of the things about being alive and in the bush, but our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions behind me. Hopefully we'll be back with you shortly. Sorry about this everybody, perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. The team is rushing around madly trying to fix it and we'll be back with you as soon as we can.
Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our engineering department and our tech department will be working on getting us back up and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world. But we will be back up and stick with us, because you never know what might be on your screen when we return. Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gari repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Please bear with us. Our engineering department and our tech department will be working on getting us back up and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world. But we will be back up and stick with us because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you. Now everybody, this is actually quite special because just behind that, that's a cub, just behind the male. And I always love watching the little cubs with their males, whether it's uncles or father. No one really knows because we have this impression that, you know, males have a dreadful relationship with young lions and, well, I mean, if they're strangers, they absolutely do. But it's always so nice to see them approaching each other. Here come the consorting pair. Now we have moved slightly. They're over there. Let me just get out of the way. And he's sort of shielding her from moving too far away from him. They're too tight. That's very artistic for him. So, it's, oh, first of all, big sorry that we were down to have something to eat.
They're very reticent to come towards the kill. They're very kind of nervous of it. Just hold on a second. I'm just going to talk to Aubrey. Go ahead, Aubrey. Yeah, affirmative. Um, they're all, well, uh, yeah, most of them here. Two lionesses, three lionesses, two males, two, uh, three youngsters. Copy that. Look, they're watching the vultures now. This is just too fantastic. This is really a pretty good going for my second drive back to have this kind of a sighting. And they are very sweet, as many of you are saying. They're such sweet little things. They are, especially with Dad in the background. I'm going to say Dad, most likely Uncle. 75% chance it's Uncle. There, now there's one eating. Have a look there. Look. And Justin, you're wondering about the cub's claws and whether they'll be sharper or less sharp than an adult's claws. Justin, I think you'll find they'll be uh, probably slightly sharper because they're smaller. They're like little needles. And I think you'll find that they'll be slightly sharper even than the adult's claws. The adults' claws are, are not blunt, but they're not, um, I mean, they are sharp, I think, though, but given their size, because they're so much bigger, I think you'll find that they're probably not quite as sharp as these little ones. I know many of you were worried yesterday about that cub that had a limp and certainly that you saw it this morning. There's one of them who's remained very much asleep just behind there. And maybe there is a bit of an injury there. Here come the other two now, the consorting pair. Gosh, you don't even know where to look here. We might also do a VR here. VM, do you want to fire it up? I'll explain. Oh, hang on. We are quite close. That's amber eyes in front of us. A bit of growling going on. Cubs now getting a little bit anxious because there's been some growling from the adults. So they're moving away. We are throwing. The cubs now moving away from the kill. Adults have all come in now. That big male in front there has been trying to mate with a lioness who's just sitting in front of you. To the left, you can see a lioness feeding. And in front there, that's Amber Eyes. We know her very well. And she's the one seemingly coming into Estrus, and the big male there who's growling away there, trying to keep him away from the little cub who's just lifted its head. He's the one who's been trying to mate with Amber Eyes. Now you can hear the little cubs calling. Now we don't know who the father is, which of these two males could be one of them. the other two as well, in a coalition of four. This is just spectacular. Listen to the growls. Now that, it's difficult to tell who the growls are coming from. I think it's the lioness behind there with the three cubs. But it's an absolutely terrifying sound. 
It's a deep, throaty growl. And it's coming from the male. The cubs are now growling at each other, trying to suckle and play. What an unbelievable sighting. And to the far front left there, a male fast, fast asleep. This is incredible. Three females, two big males, three youngsters, and somewhere around here, another female with two more youngsters who are slightly smaller than these ones. And also the other two members of this coalition of four male lions somewhere around. But this fellow right in front of us is not going anywhere because his consort, the amber-eyed lioness, is coming into estrus. She's one of two lionesses in this pride of five that doesn't have cubs yet. And if this male has anything to do with it, that situation will change fairly soon, probably within the next hundred days. It's a real honour and privilege to spend time with animals like this. Look, she's going down to have something to eat now. And the male watching her carefully. Watch him see his eyes just eyeing her up the whole time. Two of them now feeding just to the left. Right, I'm going to move back a bit just to give them some space. What an incredible, incredible sighting this is. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I was just trying to do my finishing off there, Vim. Thanks for that. Thanks. I'm just going to move back. We're obviously not going anywhere, anyone, everyone, but Aubrey's coming into the sighting, so I just want to move back so that he can have a bit of space. And while we do that, let's head back to Brent and get an update on him. Well, unfortunately, we don't have much to say. Uh, so what we've done is we've done the whole of uh, Triple M, which is the boundary between Arethusa and Juma, looking for tracks. We're now doing Gauri Main and doing the same thing just trying to make sure crew doesn't cross out. I have heard there were Tingana tracks coming north, so having a look for those as well. But the leopards seem to be very, very scarce at the moment. And it is still a beautiful morning to be traversing through the African bush. And so far, we haven't even really seen too many Impala this morning. But it, that's how it goes sometimes in the bush. And remember, we are alive. We can't plan it. Hi, Justin. Justin's wondering what Sindile's names are on the other reserve. As far as I know, I think uh, it was decided that it, she, he shall just be Sindile from now on, but I think his old name on some of the other reserves was Madiba. But Sindile it is. And Sindile I shall keep using, otherwise I shall confuse myself. I just, Karula and those cubs seem to have flown magically. We're just checking very carefully to make sure she hasn't ducked down to the south. And then, so about over there is where Tingana's tracks were heading north. So we're going to go check all the way down there. Hopefully he's decided to come visit us in Juma. We haven't seen him in quite some time on Juma. Jamie's found him on Arethusa a few times.
That's so far. We are just searching, but that is half the fun, being out in the bush, seeing what we can find, and you never know what you're going to find. And uh, I'm hoping we're going to find something spectacular, whether it be fauna or flora, and maybe we'll find the first flower on the baboon's tail after the rain. I have been looking for other little wildflowers popping up, but unfortunately, nothing just yet. It might not have been enough rain to trigger those wildflowers. It has a good spot to check for tracks. Well, hi, Honey Bear. Honey Bear says, how long are our seasons in the US? It's an average of three months, but it appears that ours are much shorter. Well, I would actually, I would say ours are a bit longer. So we don't have the traditional four seasons that uh, you have in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we, we pretty much have two seasons. We have uh, cold and dry uh, and hot and wet. <laughs> so we have a, a dry season and a rainy season. And the rainy season is summer and the dry season is winter. So we don't have that very distinct sort of autumn uh, and spring. And also it's never, the same. Every year it's different. There's a slight bit of movement on that. I mean, this year we're experiencing a drought, so that, that's changed everything completely. And for the last 10 years, we've been having a very wet season, so uh, they're not, not as obviously distinct between the seasons out here. But now, while we're searching for leopards, I think I should get your brains going this morning. Let's see if we can come up with a quiz. Jandre, what do you think? Mammals, trees, birds? Uh, who dung it? Oh, I need to find some dung if we're going to who dung it. And we can't do the easy dung. Dung, everyday dung. We need some special dung. So we'll keep looking for that. But while we look for some who dung it material, uh, I was thinking we should, uh, hmm. Aha, this is a good one, because it's quite actually quite a tricky one. Which is the largest, in terms of numbers, mammal migration in Africa? In which, in terms of numbers, is the largest mammal migration in Africa? If you know the answer to that one, pop an email to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag SafariLive. Which, in terms of numbers, is the largest mammal migration in Africa? So I'm going very slowly, no rushing about this morning. Hi, Yugi. Yuki would like to know, are there any fennec foxes around our area? Uh, unfortunately not, Yuki. A fennec is in, endemic to North Africa, so more than 7,000 kilometers away from us. Um, we don't have any fox species. We do have a few jackal species. I'm just trying to find, I think that one's going to be the most clear. Jandre? Am I the correct distance away? Okay, I'm just going to jump out here. to show you a track, but I've got to take out my, my, my hot water bottle. <laughs> I don't like the cold very much. Okay. So this is actually a really cool track, and it's a very big one. Now, you can see three very distinct toes. It's quite a bit more difficult to see the back foot here, but this is an art fark track, and this is actually quite a fresh art fark track, I would say probably just before dawn. Now, my camera trap's up, and I am really hoping we catch a camera, uh, an art fark on my camera trap. I think I'm going to go change the, the card today so that we can have a look. So there's art fark, very distinct. They've got those massive claws for digging. And this, this is a particularly big art fark. I'd say it's a very big male. And they can actually weigh up to about 60 kilograms, which is about 130, 140 pounds. So bigger than, quite a bit bigger than Karula. But... It is still one of the elusive species that we have not yet put on live drive. Fingers crossed that this dry season 
and they might be out a little bit later or a little bit earlier. That'll give us the chance to see one. Taxon saw one two nights ago, uh, but quite late at about 7.30 uh, on his way home. So fingers crossed that we are going to get the mysterious aardvark on Safari Live uh, during this drought. And while we continue our search for tracks and interesting things and some interesting dung for who dung it, let's go back to James and those incredible little lion cubs. We're all moving towards this one male now, the consort of Amber Eyes who's now eating. And still that one little lion at the back there has not moved. Doesn't appear to be any great distress, but isn't moving around much. The other two moving around quite a lot. Go. It's just so wonderful to spend time with cubs like this. You forget how privileged it is and how special it is when we don't see them all the time. <laughs> but again, the one behind, just not that interested in the play, but possibly still feeling a bit injured. I don't think these chaps are too far away from leaving this kill. The one male has gone off. Don't know, I mean, he could easily just be going to Bufferzook Dam for a drink and then come back again. But what a scene that is. Isn't that an unbelievable scene? Here we go, males with the youngsters. Nicole, you're in Texas and you're wondering about how soon it will be before the male or the female with the older cubs mates again. She will only mate again, Nicole, when they are, when these youngsters are ready to leave, basically. So probably in about two years, two and a half years, and the males will start to get chased out and the females will become uh, sexually active and they'll start having their own cubs and then the mothers at the same time kind of come into estrus again. So I think that's what you'll find. It's at least sort of two, two and a half years before she will become ready to mate again. Now I thought we were going to have to leave but it seems that Aubrey is leaving which means that we can stay. I think we'll just do that. I haven't driven very far today, but you know, on a day like this, what's the point? Fuel strike anyway. And there's a fuel strike, exactly. <laughs> Joshua, a good question is not an uncommon one about whether or not lions can get sick from eating rancid or diseased flesh. Well, the very animal they're eating now is called a buffalo, obviously, and all of the buffalo in the Kruger National Park have been exposed to and in many cases exhibit what we call bovine tuberculosis. Now we know the lions pick that up from the buffalo, they pick it up from the kudu as well that get it and various others. So yes, they can pick up diseases. Largely, however, their constitutions are such that they're able to cope with it. So for example, were you to be, sorry, just hold on one second, uh, Aubrey's pulled out, so you're welcome to make your way straight in. Um, uh, you know, there'll be all sorts of parasites and things in rancid flesh, masses amount, massive amounts of bacteria and stuff that would make you and I probably dead very quickly. Um, because that's what lions are designed to do. They've got the digestive systems to cope with it, and so they don't get sick. Their bodies can uh, cope with the parasites and the bacteria. Uh, they either just live with the diseases, as they do with TB, um, or um, they just their bodies will kill off whatever diseases it is that they pick up from carcasses. 
anthrax also apparently they can pick up but that's probably more through the spores that get into the air what an unbelievable morning Kion, you want to know about salmonella and whether, specifically your question is, do lions get salmonella from eating birds and chickens? Um, I've never seen a lion eating a chicken, have you, Vian? Mm, in zoos. I, definitely in zoos, I'm sure they eat them. Kion, I don't know. Um, I imagine it's possible that they could get salmonella. Well, I actually have no idea. I'm not even going to half answer that question. I'm going to throw it out to the viewers and say, do you know of cats that get salmonella and if it's possible or not and it's quite possible that if a domestic cat can get salmonella then you know closely related animal like these lions may well too i don't think kion though that wild birds out here and they will eat wild birds from time to time like um, franklins and that sort of thing um, they could uh, carry i don't think that they carry things like salmonella Now, VM was showing me trying to take photographs earlier on. My ultimate photograph of lions would be a little youngster playing with a big male. And this is a fail to materialize. I thought it was going to two or three times today. Isn't this an amazing sight? <laughs> you just don't know where to look. There's lion magnificence everywhere. Look at that. Leah, um, we're just looking at those two lines there, and the one of them at the back seems to be maybe slightly injured. Leah, you say, would it be a, what, would we step in to help it if the rest of the pride just left it alone? No, Leah, I'm afraid we wouldn't. Now we've got all three of them there. Uh, we would try and just leave things to be as they were uh, for a number of reasons. Firstly, we're in an open system, and therefore... Um, you know, the policy kind of is let nature take its course. That, as has been pointed out by some viewers, is not necessarily always possible and is not necessarily consistent with our approach because we do pump artificial water, we build dams, and so, I mean, it's not necessarily the case that nature is always taking its course here. But, secondly, um, with lions, you could rescue it, sure, then you could raise it and it would very quickly become a, uh, well, physical liability, but also uh, almost impossible to reintroduce to a population of, of wild lions. It's not impossible, but it is very, very, very difficult and very few reserves will take them. You couldn't go into Botswana and try and reintroduce it there. The Kruger wouldn't take a lion that had been hand-raised because it would most likely be killed. So we rather just let things be. Here we go. It's up now. And you can hear some green wood hoopoos calling in the background. Come on, get up, let's see. Oh dear. Yeah, I know that back leg's not good. Mm -hmm. I don't like to see that because lions are the most mercenary when it comes to looking after sick and injured individuals. That little thing is too weak to keep up with the pride, they'll leave it. But because they're still so young, you know, what may well happen is that the mother will leave them all here, or somewhere close by, when she goes off to hunt again. It's not like at this age they have to move too much with the pride.
as you can see that's quite a severe injury to the back left leg. But unfortunately it's just part of what happens out here, especially with lions. Probably a 1 in 10 chance of a male making it to adulthood. Maybe 3 in 10 for a female. But as we keep saying, animals are so resilient. And the most obvious example of it we had the other day, of course, was that buffalo sighting that Jamie had. Look at the mother coming, stalking them. Go ahead, Vin. Look at them playing there. Good, thanks, and you. Isn't that beautiful? Two here now. Um, I'm more than happy to move out. I've had a great sighting, so make your way straight here. I'm 100% sure. Probably we'll make our way slowly out. All right, everybody, we're going to head out of the sighting. We've had an unbelievable morning with these lions. Then from Buffalo's Hook's going to come in. Um, we don't want to put too much pressure on them, not much space in here. So we're going to pull out and make some space. And we'll watch with interest uh, what happens with that youngster. I think one of us will come back here this afternoon and see what's going on. But what an unbelievable morning we've had. And let's hope that little one manages to survive. Look at that. Isn't that cute? <laughs> this is just too wonderful. Okay, everyone. Let's head out. Vim, are you satisfied with our lion sighting this morning? We go, who dung it? Now, who dung that? So, here we have a nice piece of dung, and you can see it's quite a big piece it's stuck together, but they are little individual drolikis. Drolikis is a very Afrikaans or very South African saying, and about the little bits of dung. So, this is quite a tricky one. I don't even think Chandra knows what it is. He thinks he knows what it is. But uh, who dung it? If you know who dung it, send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Who dung it? We'll keep the dung for the answers a little later. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like Mr. Tingana has made it this far north just yet. So hopefully, he still keeps coming. Or what has happened is he's crossed into Torchwood, which is behind me. So hopefully, uh, we're going to keep checking Cheetah Cut Line. One of his favorite routes is to come through and down onto Central and into Juma. So, fingers crossed that we find some tracks there. Yeah, let me. Sorry, lots of all my warm things. Oh, stuck on the door as well. Okay, there we go. Oh, where's my ears gone? Ah, there we go. So, I'm pretty convinced the Karula hasn't left Juma, but where exactly she is, is proving a little bit difficult to find out. I think she's possibly still in those blocks to the east of the Mawati where there's not a lot of roads. So hopefully Herbie is figuring out the puzzle of where she's gone. I haven't heard from him in a while, so it means, it sometimes means he's on really fresh tracks and he turns the radio off so he can listen and not be disturbed. Well done to Judy H and Aaron and a few others. And they're estimated to be between 4.5 and 5 million 
bats, they actually black out the sun. Incredible, incredible, incredible animal migration. Uh, of course, the more well-known migrations in Africa, one of them is the, the Serengeti Maasai Mara, the wildebeest zebra and Thompson's gazelle migration. As I think, if I remember my numbers correctly, there's about 1.8 million animals in total that are in that migration. And that is not even the largest large ungulate migration in Africa. So when I'm referring to large ungulates, antelopes, zebras, those type of things. And uh, the largest uh, large or large ungulate or large mammal migration in Africa is actually in southern Sudan. It is white-eared cob uh, migrating from the Sud to the grassy plains of, of uh, Al Bazaar National Park in uh, South Sudan which is very high up on my bucket list of places to go. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, South Sudan is not a country one enters uh, without taking lots of precautions, such as bulletproof vests. Wow, we've got some clever, clever whodunits, and that was quick. It is indeed a water buck. So I'm just waiting to hear who was spot on there. Fuzzman Sparkles. <laughs> interesting, interesting handle, Fuzzman Sparkles. Well done, it is indeed water buck. Uh, it is quite a difficult one, so the only other one that can look quite similar to this is, is, is wildebeest sometimes. And uh, what happens is it's probably had a lot of water recently and that has caused the dung to stick together. So other times when they haven't had that much water, the dung will break off into these individual little pieces and well, not quite like that, but you get the, the, the general idea. Uh, someone said cheetah, if it was any predator dung, I would not be touching it with my hands. So predator dung. Uh, has lots of bad things in it, flukes and tapeworms and, and, and all sorts. So you don't ever want to touch predator or carnivore dung or primate dung with your hands. Um, all of those carry uh, lots of parasites that are easily transmitted to human beings. So when you handle carnivore feces, uh, you generally want to have a pair of gloves on. And it seems like the clouds are rolling in. And it's going to get chillier this morning. So I'm quite glad I've got my pink friend on my lap. But while my pink friend, myself and jean and of course the only hipster in the Sabi Sands, go keep on looking for leopards, uh, we're going to uh, see how Commander Bond is faring uh, in the northern part of the reserve. Look over there, everybody. A white-backed vulture, probably about 500 meters, 600 meters, or um, 1,800 feet, or 2,000 feet or so from the carcass. But they probably, well, might not be able to see the buffalo from there, but certainly can see the other vultures. And as soon as they start to descend, it will be an indicator that the lions have moved off and this vulture will then go in there as well. So they're very patient and they use their unbelievable eyesight to stay safe and far away from any potential danger. It's difficult to look at a vulture and think a beautiful bird, I must confess. Um, one does look at them and feel a deep sense of appreciation. But beauty, mm, not so much. Virginia, you're in Kentucky and you're wondering about whether or not these vultures uh, will be chased by the lions if they come down too soon. Yes, they will definitely. Um, if the vultures go anywhere near that carcass while the lions are still there, they'll be chased away. And if they don't move quickly, they'll be killed. So 
they are very careful of the lions. The hooded vultures, we saw them on the ground yesterday, almost in between the lions, but mainly because they were eating the lion dung. They weren't going anywhere near. And I nearly, I nearly retched as I said that. Um, <clears throat> they weren't going anywhere near the buffalo carcass. Those vultures there, the white back, they want meat. They want the, the rotting carcass. They're not interested in eating lion dung that is beneath them. And so they will wait for the lions to go away completely. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but the sky has turned from perfectly gorgeous winter blue to slightly ominous grey. And I believe there was a front coming in today. Well, there it is. It has arrived. We had one day off winter and we're back into it. But we're going to find now, yes, they're going to be cold snaps. We're going to find the temperature increasing slowly over the next month, quite substantially, but for when there are fronts coming through. And September is often one of our hottest months, interestingly, before the rains start. I'm not particularly looking forward to that, I have to tell you, after the summer of last year. Right, now I wanted to show you this. Take my leggy blankie off. Now many of you have seen these, of course, and the question that was asked of me yesterday by Jean Dre while we were driving around was whether or not these uh, baboons' tails, which is what these plants are, many of you will have seen them before, whether or not they will flower now. You've lost sound. Yeah, that's back now. How's that? You can still hear me, can you? How's that? Yep. Yes? Um, whether or not they would flower at this time of the year, and I said I thought they might, given their water, but they've sprouted just as a result of the 20 millimeters of rain we had here, just under an inch, somewhere between half an inch and an inch, depending on where you are on the reserve, and they've sprouted almost immediately, and they're now starting to go yellow again. So just almost as quickly as they've come up, they're going to go down again, so maybe they won't flower. But what I wanted to show you, if I can just break off a piece here. We were talking about xerophytic plants yesterday, so succulents or plants that can cope with dry desert conditions. And this is not a true succulent. And I always thought it was until I broke it open. But if you look at the end of it there, there are a whole lot of thin tubes. It's made up of a great sort of matrix of thin tubes. Now these sort of thin tubes of what we got or will create an effect called capillary action and capillary action is a kind of spontaneous vacuum so if you put a thin enough tube into liquid uh, the liquid will because of I think probably because of the internal pressure within the um, liquid will push up the tube and that's what this is made of it's basically made of lots and lots of capillary tubes which makes it massively efficient at absorbing water when there is some in the um, in the surface and so it sprouts very quickly but it also means that as soon as the water leaves the surface of the soil it gets sucked out and so it goes completely dormant. It's really quite an interesting well I think fascinating plant and that is the baboon's tail zero fighter ready nervous. You like zero fighter ready nervous Vim? Yes it sounds like a combat game character. It sounds like a combat game character. Yes, maybe you should um, maybe you should have that as your as your Dota character, Zero Fighter, ready, nervous. <laughs> My blankie back on. It's so cold. Kirsten, you're going to have to go with that name again. Ah, Fuzzman Sparkles, of course. Uh, that also is an excellent name for a, for a character, don't you think, Viem? Fuzzman Sparkles and Zero Fighter Ready Nervous. Fuzzman Sparkles, <laughs> you want to know <laughs> if any animals eat the baboon's tail? Fuzzman Sparkles, um, I'm going to call you FMS from now on. FMS, I don't know. Um, if any animals eat them. I don't think they do greatly. The leaves, yes, I've certainly seen some grazers eating the leaves. But this thing, I think, is largely nutrient-free. It's basically just a conduit for water to get into the leaves. Um, yeah. No. Doesn't taste very good at all. 
Fuzzman Sparkles. <laughs> Justin, you want to know what my favourite bushel tree to eat in the bushes? Well, I mean, the marula fruit is definitely the, the favourite. Um, but otherwise, there's not a great deal out here, other than fruits on the bushes, which are, you know, you get white berry bushes, which are nice. The gory bushes make quite nice fruit. The sour plums make delicious fruit. But otherwise, uh, if you're a vegetarian living out here, I think you'd really struggle to survive, to be honest. Um, there's not much to eat in the way of sort of salady type things, but for that of the leaves of Zizifus mucronata, they taste pretty good. But the rest out here, no, really not great for salad or vegetarian eating. Tubers, you get some that you can eat, very bitter, and a number of very toxic lily tubers. You really got to be very careful about what you eat there. Herbert, of course, and we'll get back out and bushwalk fairly soon. Herbert um, is brilliant with that sort of stuff. He, he could probably survive out here eating just veget vegetation. I think I'd get very thin and die quite quickly. Just driving past a whole field here of baboon's tails and seeing if I can spot a flower. And I know Brent was talking about flowers earlier and I said to Viem, uh, rather sarcastically, I said he's got much more chance of finding Karula and the cubs than he does of a wild flower at this time of the year. And I may be forced to eat my words if I can find the baboon's tail flower, but that's quite interesting. They haven't produced any there. See that? Despite all of the greenery here. Righty. On we go. Um, we're going to continue down towards the south, I think, and maybe try and give Brent a bit of a hand trying to find Karula's tracks. Very hard, crusted ground at the moment. Uh, while we do that, let's go back across to the inimitable fellow himself and see what he's managed to find. Well, we haven't managed to find too much, and as you can see, we're having a bit of a quiet sunrise safari. Uh, luckily, James was with those incredible Inkahumas, and we have been working uh, in a grid-like pattern. We checked up to Sydney's Dam, we've checked down Triple M, we've checked the whole of Gary Main, and we've checked Cheetah Cut Line. Uh, so now I'm doing Drakensberg, and we're basically just going to zigzag our way through Juma, hoping to find a track. Oh, sorry, I think Abel's calling me. Standing by. Now, I think Karula is in this, these eastern blocks uh, to the east. Oh, there we go, Herbie. Maybe he's got some news for us. Standing by, Herb. Kobe, thanks very much, Herb. Yeah, I'm quite close. So I'm going to come give you a hand. Do you want me to check Mamba and the Mawati? Oh, exciting stuff. Okay, Cobby, thanks very much. I'll, I'll come down and give you a hand. So, Herbie's got fresh tracks of a female and a male leopard uh, towards Ledwood Road. So, we're very close to the area. So, we're going to slowly make our way there. And uh, it could be this mating pair that's been seriously avoiding us. And we've heard them, I found their tracks, but we just haven't been able to find them. Hi, Chris. Chris is wondering, at what age does a young male leopard's tracks get bigger than a female? Uh, probably just under a year, his tracks are already bigger than his mom's. Uh, maybe eight, nine months. Okay. Oh, exciting. I wonder which leopards it can be. I wonder, wonder, wonder. I'm very excited to add another leopard to my leopard list. 
So we worked it out on drive the other afternoon and since I've been at Safari Live, which is about a year and six months now, uh, I have seen 20 different individual leopards and that's not all the ones you guys might have enjoyed on the drives because I know, well with Jamie, you would have seen um, Shiluva 2005 model, so that's 21 and then also Scott saw Bahuti, that's 22 and I think, I think 22 leopards is about all the leopards we've seen in, in, the, last, in the last year and a half or so. So that's incredible uh, for the size of area we operate in, the fact that we've seen 22 different individual leopards. Hi, X Ranger. Uh, X Ranger is wondering about the leopard scat collection program and uh, the paternity tests and when there's going to be information. So, with all of these major scientific projects, uh, before any of that information is available to public or to anyone, it has to go through peer review. It's going to be years uh, before that data is, is available. Uh, hopefully. A year rather than years but one must also realize that that panthera has got a lot of other projects going on and even that scat collection is, is more and and to identify the different genetics of leopards is the paternity in the sabi sands is a very low uh, low priority study on that on on in that greater study so the main reason for collecting the scat and getting uh, the genetic markers from from the scat is for uh, conservation reasons. So there's still quite a, tr a legal trade in leopard skins for different reasons all over Africa. So what they're doing is collecting genetics from as many different leopards from many different parts of Africa as possible uh, to try establish uh, when an illegal skin is found or confiscated they can test it against that database to, to find out where exactly did that skin originate from which will also help figuring out which leopard populations are under the most threat. So from so far, the first initial set of data for, from the conservation point of view has shown that the two leopard populations that are under the most threat in southern and east Africa is northern Mozambique, southern Tanz Tanzania. That is where most of the illegally obtained skins are coming from. So even though in those illegal skins, I think there were four or five skins uh, that were genetically traced back to Sabi Sands leopards. So that type of information is really important for, a, for, for, for a, uh, an organization like Panthera uh, to establish future plans for leopard conservation, not only in very limited areas like the Sabi Sands or Greater Kruger, but to get a, get a plan for, for the whole of Africa. I hope that helps explain a little bit better. So while we zoot off to go help Herbie try to find those leopards, uh, let's go see where James is and what he's up to. James is not too far from where Brent is. Um, as far as I understand it, Herbert has got some leopard tracks over there, around there. So we're just going to lurk around this area. Of course, if we find Karula, uh, Brent will be deeply upset with us. Um, well, he'll probably be quite happy with us. He'll be he'll be gracious about it. I just wanted to quickly stop at this tree here. It is a knob thorn that has been destroyed by the elephants, you can see, and continues to grow miraculously. Very few knob thorns actually do survive the attentions of elephants. This one wasn't de-rooted or debarked, so it has managed to survive, um, but very clearly going to be favoured forage as we go towards the business end of the dry season. The birds have shut up but for one or two doves and that's because I think the sun has disappeared behind these clouds. <laughs> Liam, why is this car doing that when I started? It's going... 
Messed up idle control? No. VMC says has a messed up idle control. I think I probably could have told him that. I just don't know what that means. Um, right. Can you see me? You want to know where the elephants have gone. Can you see me? I have no idea where the elephants have gone. I'd love to know myself. I came up with a theory all on my own the other day as to why it is sometimes we have elephants here and then they disappear. So you go, you know, you go around every tree, shake a bush and an elephant falls out of it. And then that happens for a week or two and then they're gone for a week or two and then they come back again. I have a theory and I, it's totally untested so it might be utter nonsense but we know that trees talk to each other. We know that they're able to communicate through pheromones, possibly also through fungal mycelia in the ground. That was taught to us by our old pal Sam Chevalier. And uh, I suspect that because elephants have such a profound effect on the vegetation of an area, that eventually an entire area, rather than one tree becoming distasteful by you know, producing tannins because it's being preyed on, um, so, just as a bit of background, that's what will happen. If something like an impala goes to eat a, uh, on a tree, it will, uh, depends on the species of tree, but many trees will then pr increase the tannin production. The impala will then have to move away to another tree or to a few trees along because um, it becomes distasteful and becomes quite toxic. Now, if you have a whole herd of elephants blasting through an area like this, I think it's quite likely that every tree in the area starts to communicate with these pheromones and because they eat so many different species of trees, even if they're not talking inter-specifically, they're talking intraspecifically, so within each species of tree, and I think you'll find an entire area will suddenly become distasteful to the elephants. They'll move away, they'll have to go and eat somewhere else, and then when that kind of effect is reduced because it's expensive for a tree to produce ta tannins and other toxins when those tannins have leaked out and stopped being produced then the elephants will come back that's my my guess i don't think it's too bad a theory do you vm no, you weren't listening so vm doesn't know if my theory was good or bad right i'm going to drive you through a knobthorn tree I did it 10 minutes ago, I'm going to do it again. You're in big trouble now. My ego is much too large for you to be ignoring what I have to say. Sorry. And Stephen in the UK, you want to know why we haven't seen any rhinos. Uh, Stephen, it's because we don't show rhinos. There is a th school of thought that says, you know, if we show rhinos on wild earth and people are really astute and perhaps know where we are, it's, it's, there's a possibility that the scourge of poaching um, could, or, you know, let's pretend there was a poacher watching that they could then find the rhino. Uh, we, well, it's possible. Any effect that we could have negatively on the rhino poaching situation in this area, we don't want to. And that's why we just don't show rhino. We do see them every so often, um, but we don't show them on the camera and we'll move, them or we'll move the camera away. So sometimes we'll be driving along like this, there'll be rhino over there, and we'll just keep talking like this and we just ignore them and carry on going. It's a very sad situation, but unfortunately I think it is probably the right call for now. Whether or not we'd have an effect on poaching, we don't know. If there's the slightest possibility that we could, then absolutely it's the best idea just simply not to show rhino. But that, Stephen, is why we don't see them. They do occur here, and it's a very sad thing that we can't show you the joys of little um, white rhino calves and their magnificent mothers and the really impressive white rhino bulls that we do get in this area. I can hear a woodpecker calling up ahead. I just want to see if we can't see it. Because this camera that we have has that super zoom. There it is. It's right on the top of that tree there, VMP. You see it there? The very pinnacle of the tree is a cardinal woodpecker. There we are. Brilliant. Just surveying its domain. Are you right at the end of the lens there? Yes, all right. 
Uh, the slight shake you can see in the picture there, everyone, is because we're right at the end of the lens, which means that every time VM's heart beats, that's really what's happening. You, there's just a slight jolt. <laughs> what happens if you let go completely? No, the bird flies away. I see. <laughs> Hi, Gail. Nice one from you, especially after this morning. You say the bird calls sound louder um, and more stridulent or stridulent the closer to spring we get. And certainly this morning was very loud and you say it's breeding time. No, it's nowhere near breeding time yet. I think it's a function of the sun we had this morning and the bit of rain that we had the other day. It probably would have brought out a few insects and probably made some of the male birds a bit more territorial. Yes, certainly the changing day length is going to move us towards the breeding season, but we're not at breeding season for the birds yet, no. Nowhere near enough insects, nowhere near uh, enough in the way of seeds and flowers and that sort of thing for them to eat or fruits. Here's a water buck. And just as I say that, everyone, what I do want you to do is keep an eye out and an impala. Our cup runneth over them. That is a particularly dun-coloured water buck, isn't it? It's not very grey. Let me just move a little bit cl uh, forward. First of August, it's time to start looking for the very first Wahlberg's eagle. They are the first to come back. And let's see if they don't come back fairly soon. You know, that chap really doesn't want to be on camera. Or that lady. Here we have the impala, and he is obviously relieving himself. That is just what happens. As soon as I look at an animal, it uh, decides to void its bowels. Impala all looking in pretty good nick, despite the seeming paucity of good things to eat. And very, very efficient users of water, most of the African antelope out here. And you can see that from the little pellets of dung. Those little pellets of dung um, are basically, they're, 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 they're not dry completely, but they, they are very dry. And the impala and most of the antelope out here, and especially the gazelles, something like a springbok, which you don't find here, but in the drier areas, they've got exceptionally efficient kidneys that suck out all the water, and so their dung comes out almost dry. Unlike the buffalo, of course, which is very poor with water conservation and has to drink a huge amount. Now Brent is now on some leopard tracks. He is off the vehicle, so with any luck, uh, we will have a leopard fairly soon. But you know what these leopards are like. Particularly good at hiding from us. So we'll now drive off down a road called Ledwood Road, down towards the valley of the Mulwati and we'll see if we get lucky. <laughs> Hello Aaron in New Zealand, lovely to hear from you again. And you, <laughs> you say you're hoping for the Anderson male leopard, that would be a great birthday present for you. Well, happy birthday Aaron. But. Um, the Anderson male, highly unlikely to be found where we are now. We're now on the very eastern fringes of Juma, and the Anderson male only stretches to the sort of western fringes of Arethusa, and sometimes up to the Arethusa Lodge, which is kind of in the middle of Arethusa, that's off to the west of us. So to find him here would be very unusual indeed. But we'll do our best, Aaron, if we find giant male leopard tracks, most likely him, and we'll get on them as soon as we can. Oof, it's really taking on a late season colour. Let's have a look over this viewpoint here, beyond this very picturesque dead knob thorn tree. Now, if you look straight ahead of us there, you can see that the vegetation has taken on that kind of greyish, 
browny, coppery, goldy colour. And that's completely normal for this time of the year, but it is different from when I left here. When I left here, it was it was copper and gold because all of the Cambritum leaves had turned that colour and they were all starting to fall off now. And now you can see that they are... Hang on, I'm just going to talk to Herbie. Now you can see that all the leaves have fallen. Herbie, Brent's on foot, I think. Go ahead. Okay, Kobe, I, I can't get hold of him, but we will tell him that if we can. Uh, Herbert has found a drag mark. He's not far from here at all. And so he and Brent will hopefully be lucky. Um, Herbie, where's that drag mark going? To the north of Lenut. I can book a Brent. I've spoke to him. Okay, Kobe, I'm on Ledwood now. I'll drive this road slowly. So, here is where Herbert says, he said north of Ledwood, you heard him there. So, he reckons somewhere in here. I think Herbert actually might have found them. Let's, we'll see now. Brent will let you know, he's not far from here. It will be very exciting indeed. Of course, I will be very jealous not to see Karula's little babies maybe this afternoon. It sounds pretty good, I must say. So Brent's just over here. <laughs> Justin, you say which drive do I prefer, the sunset or sunrise safari? Justin, it really depends on what we see. It depends on the weather. It depends on how I'm feeling. Yeah, I, I really can't say which one I prefer more. Um, I, love, I, I love both those times of the day, the crepuscular times of the day, just as the sun set and just before it comes up. Um, I think, interestingly enough, for driving around and absorbing the peace of the wilderness, I find the evening probably slightly more pleasurable. And in the morning, it's just that much more exciting because you have this sort of feeling of expectation. So I, it just depends on how I'm feeling, whether I want excitement or I want some peace. Yeah, it really has changed quite substantially in the last little while. The vegetation, I mean, and the colors. And just to give you an idea, there is a substantial drainage line running down through this sort of section of the reserve and I think it's probably in there that Herbert and Brent are frantically scrabbling about for Karula and her cubs. Um, Ginny, you want to know if the animals will eat the dead leaves. Uh, we did an experiment, <coughs> excuse me, we did an experiment before I went on leave a few times uh, where we picked some dead leaves and we picked them off the ground and we tried them versus green leaves they really taste like nothing at all so no I, d I haven't seen animals eating dead leaves I've no doubt that they do every so often for roughage but I don't think they're very good forage at all I think you'll find the nutrients have basically dried out of them so unless animals were fairly desperate I don't think they'd be eating the dead leaves because there certainly are plenty of them around and you know you'd expect to find them eating dead leaves much more often there's some arrow marked babblers in here, but I think they're probably. I think the bush is too thick there. I don't think we're going to get a good view of them. And I'm scanning the skies of the first Wahlberg's eagle. I think we had the first one last year, around about the 8th of August. But any time from now, and yellow billed kites also another migratory bird we can hope to see fairly soon. Yes, I don't I don't see any leopards or there or cubs here. <laughs> I 
Thank you, Sharon, in Ohio. You say you're very happy to have me back. I was almost honoured when I heard that, and then you said you were quite worried because none of the animals were going to the toilet in my absence. Well, Sharon, I'm most glad that I have now relieved what must have been a very trying time for them, um, not, not being able to, to relieve themselves in my absence. Um, <laughs> I'm so, I'm, so, I'm so pleased, Sharon, that I've managed to have some good conservation effect. <laughs> There's another field of baboon's tails here, and I'm just scanning them to see if there isn't a flower. But I don't see even one. I don't even see a bud. Ah, now if we switch off here. I can hear Brentley a smith driving through the bushes. It sounds like three or four hundred elephants. So I'm sure they've got something, which is very exciting. <laughs> I suppose he could have just gone in from this side. <laughs> He's, he's, he's come in from the other side, everyone, and he's only about, I don't know, 40 meters from where we are now. He's only in there because Herbert has definitely found something. Let's just hope there is vehicle access. This is a very difficult, difficult block to be in. We'll just see if we can't spot whatever it is that they're going to go and look for from this side, because no one else is in this area, so it's absolutely fine for us both to be looking. There's Herbert's vehicle over there. Herbert. Have you got Herbert too? Well, here, yeah, Herbert will give us an update. Herberto! He did find them. Tila, <laughs> Tila Kuswan. Yeah, long ago Brent. Okay, so he says Brent is on his way there to the leopards. To to Jill. Okay. Fresh bread. Okay, good. Fresh yam. Fresh food, and so that's brilliant. We should have a sighting for a few hours to come. As soon as Brent's in there, we'll cross over to him. In fact, let's head straight across to Brent right now. So we've managed to find the remains of a kill, but I can't see any leopards. There's a bit of meat left there, not much though, the remains of an impala. So we're right in a little river system. And the leopards can't be too far off if there's still meat. Now we've got male tracks, we've got cruder and cub tracks. So trying to figure out who this kill belongs to, or was it stolen by a male? We don't know. So. We're going to check around in this little river system for a bit more. There must be a leopard really close to us somewhere. Now, Jandre spotted that carcass. Well done, Jandre. Okay. Now, we're just going to move out to the other side. Maybe the leopard's lying up just a little bit away from the carcass. So while we try to figure out who and what is here, uh, let James keep you entertained. Now Herbert reckons that the, they're very fresh leopard tracks around, so I'm sure they are around. Like I said, it is not easy in there. And so I expect they'll probably come back. And as we've said many times, if you do see an, a, a lep, something like a leopard on foot, <clears throat> nine times out of ten they'll move away. And often, of course, they will see you before uh, you see them. And so it's quite possible that the leopards would have just moved away a little bit from Herbert. And then they'll come back to feed now. So let's just drive slowly through here. 
some brentful look around in the block there and then we'll go down up towards the Morwati drainage line. And maybe we'll find something else as well. I must say there hasn't been a great there hasn't been a great uh, plethora of plains game lurking around here and I find this particular part of the reserve is often quite quiet for that when we're at this time of the year. And that's because there's just not a great deal to eat. Anyway, let's hope Brent finds the leopards. We'll go in search of perhaps an elephant or two. Ah, we were asked earlier about plants to eat. And as I said, and I mean most of you will know this, but I just said that there's really only one salady type of plant to eat. And the best one is this. Oh dear, my microphone is going to pull out of my hat. Hang on. There we go. It's the Zizifus tree. And you, you, you're not a great fan, are you? Really a very acceptable salad substitute. Very few others though. All of them tend to have a very bitter taste and that's because they defend themselves from being eaten by being bitter. And this one especially, this is the guari bush. This is a Natal guari. You'll find that they don't get eaten at all because they taste so foul. They've got hairs on the leaves which of course makes them, well, it's a bit like licking a peach. Um, what are those yellow peaches called? They have a special name. Viam is looking very confused as I am. Let's see if Kirsten can give me the name. But if you lick one of those peaches, they don't taste so good. And it's the same with these Natal Gwaris. Yeah. yeah, they really are so bitter. And that's why, um, that's why the animals, um, many of the cats, will mark their territory on these uh, quarry bushes. No, not an apricot, Kirsten. It's a kind of a peach. <laughs> an apricot. No, it's not an apricot. No, it's not a nectarine. It's a peach. That it's got. It's a something peach. It's a something peach. The yellow ones with the with the hair on them. No. Oh, come on, somebody help me here. I'm going to go mad. Nectarine. It's a kind of cultivar of peach. Anyway, I'm sure you all know what I mean. Maybe you don't. Ooh. Male leopard tracks here. He is not very fresh, in fact fairly old. Not quite big enough for Anderson I'm afraid Aaron, and not here recently. I'll have to find out about those peaches when we get back. There's a lilac breasted roller, hello. Couldn't you make a slightly more pretty sound? Thank you very much. Someone called Brian Joubert, we don't know if it's our Brian Joubert, on YouTube says a cling peach. That's exactly what it is. Thank you very much. I do hope it is uh, our Brian Joubert. I'd be most impressed if he's watching and he managed to pick that up. Thank you, Brian. Cling peach. That's exactly correct. Beautiful bird. I'm just going to talk to Brent. He's hailing me. Go ahead. I'll yeah, let you so hear him. Road. I am still on Ledwood Road. Check it. You have my vehicle order. Um, if you wouldn't mind checking, if possible, if there's a way in to the southern side of the drainage system. I cannot cross it from where I am. I think if they did see Herbie, they would have moved to the south. Okay, copy. Um, do you want me to go in there and have a look? I'm going to stand by and test the carcass if anything pops up here. 
So you've heard that strategy. I do know of a little road in here that goes down towards where Brent was, so we'll go and have a look there. Copy, Brent, we'll go and have a look there. It is our Brian, that's marvellous stuff. Um, thank you. <laughs> Brian's coming back, I think, tomorrow, everybody. So that'll be nice to have him back. <laughs> and um, VM says, Brian, could you bring his headphones back, please, that he left there? He'd very much like that. <laughs> if you could bring some cling peaches with you, Brian, that would be great too, but I think we'll probably only find them in summertime. Female leopard tracks? Yes, there is a female leopard track. And that looks like quite a fresh one. Hmm. Let me get out and show you. Can you see it with the camera? Not anymore. It's all the right But you can see it if I shut the door. Here is a female leopard track. There. It's out of range. There's that is so deeply irksome. Um, I, I can't move the car so that you can see it, everybody. Anyway, there's a female leopard track going down the road there. I'm just not sure how fresh that is. It's definitely fresher than the male. So let's, let's just do a little turn. What I'm going to do... In fact, I'm going to go back up this way and I'm going to tell Herbert that there were female tracks here. Well spotted, VM. Brilliant tracking. Obviously, as always. Herbert, do you copy? Now, Brent is over there. We're going to go into the block here uh, towards where the carcass was and see if we don't get lucky. I'm just going to quickly try and tell Herbert Herbert, do you copy? All right, while I try and sort out what's going on here, let's go across to Brent and get an update from him. So what I've done, oh, I'm pulling things. Is it still in? No, it's not. Oh dear. Me and cables are just not a good combination. There we go, John Dre, look at the drainage. So <laughs> what we've done is we're right next to where the carcass is, but if that leopard or leopards saw Herbie on foot, sometimes they'll just move off slightly. So we're sitting where we've got a bit of a better view from where we are, we can see a bit further. But as you can see, we're not getting a vehicle through that area. So what I've asked James to do is come in from the other side, because they might have just crossed the drainage but I don't want to go too far away from the carcass. So I just want to sit here and listen. The other thing is this could be Gajima. So there are male leopard tracks in the area. And if it is Gajima, unfortunately, as soon as he heard us driving in, he's gone. There's not much meat left there, and it's possible he might even abandon the carcass. But we do have Krula and Cub tracks in this area as well. So lots of question marks, no answers, but we do have meat and meat is a good place to start when looking for leopards. So we're just sitting carefully, I'm, what I'm listening for is I'm, I'm listening for any little sign, probably not a noise by the leopards, what I'm really listening for is a little alarm call by some, some birds that spot the leopard close by, but we're very very confident that there is a leopard somewhere within 100 meters of us, whether it's a shy leopard that's just watching us through the trees, or whether it's Queen Karula and the cubs, and possibly even Tingana. He might have snuck across without us seeing the tracks. Although I doubt that, unless he crossed into Torchwood. Well, so many unanswered questions, but exciting times, because we know there's a leopard here somewhere. There's enough meat, I think, to warrant the leopard coming back. And James Richard said he's always up for leopards, so holding thumbs right now. I thought I had where's my binoculars. Um, so just at the top of the 
drainage where the sharp corner is above there. I thought I saw a bit of movement. It could have been a bird, but... Mm, I don't see anything now. Now, of course, leopards are incredibly well camouflaged. And if they're lying, they could be lying mere meters from us, watching us. And we just do a little loop, we'll come back through here. I just want to show you something absolutely fascinating. And it's not often you get to see things like this, so let's go have a look. If I can sneak my way between the rocks. Look at that bigger rock than I thought it was. Oh, it's a large tree. And a rock. And it was a bigger rock than I thought it was. There we go. And we'll sneak through here. So I want to show you the reason we brought the vehicle in here. And it is incredible. It's not something we get to see too often. The spot where the kill took place. I'm going to go behind the vehicle. I don't want to walk down towards the drainage in case the leopards are watching. So I'm going to go behind. So I'm going to disappear from view for a few seconds. Okay, look at this. Isn't this absolutely incredible? Now, the other reason I wanted to come look here is see if I can make out whether it's a male. And, I mean, this is... Look at this, congealed blood. So, judging on the congealing, it was yesterday, maybe late in the afternoon. And I just want to have a now careful look. You can see this is where that leopard managed to catch that impala. It looks like it happened right here. And then there's been much rolling and tumbling. And it actually expired here. And what this little bit of pile of congealed blood and, and dung here tells me is the leopard actually started feeding on it before dragging it. Into, into cover and I'm looking for tracks now to tell me whether it's a male or a female, whether it's Karula. And I've got cub tracks. So there are cub tracks here as well and I just want to double check carefully, carefully what's going on here. And so this is probably this other patch of blood up here, probably from around the throat. And see, dragged this way, up against here. And the rump was here, the head was there, and was being fed on. And I'm just checking for these tracks very carefully. I think I see a cub track, but it's, it's quite messy, as one would expect when tackling an animal bigger than you. But I think this is crew and cubs. So that makes me quite happy. But the other thing is we don't know which male was here because there are male tracks in the area as well. Did the male steal the carcass? Could it be Gajima? Did Karula mate with Gajima? Does he think it's like his babies? We hope so. Okay, I'm going to duck back around the vehicle, jump in my seat. We're going to check a little bit further to the northeast. Listening. I can't hear any bird alarm calls. Now, of course, James is going to take all the credit, but uh, he's exactly where I asked him to go check, and it seems like the leopard cubs are there. Well, there is the leopard cub, everyone, and looks like Shongili. I can hear Brent, he's not too far from here, he's, but I think she's killed this on her own. That is a little scrub hare.
and uh, yeah i can't see the others i don't know where the male is i don't know where the karula is she could be anywhere quite close by probably in the drainage line but that is beautiful little shongile eating a what looks to me like a scrub here she's just killed so brent is probably about mm, He's only about 150 feet from us. So definitely not my exceptional tracking skills that found the leopard. We did stop in this drainage line and then we heard the crunch of bone and then we knew. I mean I can actually see Brent. I'm just going to tell him quickly. Brent come in. Brent, I'm just on your left-hand side there. Um, if you look further forward, uh, we've just relocated the one cub. The rest, uh, yeah, I mean, I suspect Karula and the other one probably quite close by there. Station's just located one leopard cub on her own um, on Leadwood Road, just off the road. Isn't that wonderful, everyone? Copy, thanks. Okay, copy. Yeah, stations, um, Brent and Herbert did locate an impala carcass in this area. They follow the tracks in. Um, but we haven't found the female yet, so we'll probably just make this a one vehicle sighting at the moment. But I'm sure the mother and the other cub are around here somewhere. Copy, can you, are you not able to get your nose to the edge of the drainage and just peep in there? I'm pretty sure everybody that um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Karula is close by hang on a sec hang on if I can see her I've got her she's right in front of us there yeah Brent sorry we've got the female here as well there she is she's just through the thickets there okay. yeah, you can just see there I think we're going to hand the sighting over to Brent because he's done all the work in finding them. Brent, you get, come out onto Leadwood and come into this position. I'll move out. Um, I think you deserve this. That's a wonderful sighting. So did you see the female? So you can just see her there. So we're just going to wait here for Brent to get into a position where he can come in here and then we'll move out. Let me try and get one bog standard average picture while Brent comes in. And Herbie, of course, played an enormous role in finding these things. And he's sitting in the final control now watching, very satisfied. Now where's the little male? whose old name I'm not allowed to say, but I desperately want to. <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? I'm sure she killed that on her own. All right, now where is the little male? He often likes to sit in trees, you know. It might not be too far from here in a tree, perhaps. And interesting, they don't, um, they're quite good at not fighting over food with each other, the two of them. They often don't um, share. Safari so has, you say this cub 
Oh, sorry, this is absolute, I'm talking absolute nonsense. I forgot. These are the lighter eyes. Of course, this is definitely um, Hosanna. Sorry, it's not the female. This is the this is the ma little male. You're absolutely right, Safari Haze. Size-wise, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think we can tell at the moment on sight, but that's the liver being eaten there. It's delicious, very nutritious, full of fat, very good. Um, I do apologise, everyone. This is definitely the male. Um, and you can tell that, of course, because he has the light eyes. I forgot that the female's got the dark eyes. And, of course, this is also, he's got a 3-3 three, three, three spot pattern, which I should have picked up on immediately. Now, look carefully. We spoke earlier about whether or not they'll eat the stomach contents, and they won't. You can see that there. So he will eat the stomach, but he won't eat the stomach contents. All right, we're going to move out. We're going to let Brent come in here, and I'll see you the other side. Uh, Brent, you stand by there. I'll move out. Marvellous. Wasn't that nice? Thank you, Safari Hayes, for pointing out my idiocy. I'm a bit rusty after my time off. All right, let's go across to Brent while we move out, and he'll take you back in again. so exciting and uh, it's awesome that we got to see where the kill actually took place. You could see the cub tracks there. And so James is just moving out and we're moving in. We managed to find a spot to cross that steep drain line. There we go. There's Vim and James. Hi guys. Thanks. Can you get across? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's the male and the female's in the thicket. Where the female is, I don't know. In cool. Nice. Thanks very much, Jamesy. So it's unusual to see Vim without a coffee cup in his hand. <laughs> Normally, he is the king of coffee cups. He has multiple collections of stainless steel coffee cups that have uh, Milo and coffee mixtures in them. And you can always tell where Vim's been in camp because there is an empty coffee cup. And wires. And wires and, and maybe a pair of pliers. We can. So we just find a little spot. To jump through here. Okay. Here we go. Okay. There we go. See where James has popped in, so we're just going to go very, very slowly into here. Now, Zander, have you ever seen a leopard in the wild? No. So, Zander's first leopard in the wild. Isn't this exciting? Just go very, very slowly. So, where we were with the kill is just over the other side of this termite mound. And I'm just going very slowly because I'm not sure where. Oh, there he is. Hello, my boy. It's just, look at that. Look at him, he's protecting his scrub hair. Isn't that awesome? That is incredible. That's probably his first solo kill. Yum, yum, yum. So he's got a belly full of impala, but he still found it necessary to catch something for himself. What a clever young man. Or did his sister catch it and he stole it? Hmm, one must wonder. So, I'm not exactly, James said, oh, there's Karula. Um, where Karula was, uh, Karula's actually right next to us, hiding in the thicket, but we're gonna stick with young Hosanna, the little prince. So it turns out that I, my hunch was correct, that she was in one of these big blocks to the east of the Mawati River, where there's not a lot of roads. And fortunately, we were able to find her tracks and led us to where she killed that impala, which led us down here, which led us to them. And she has been proving quite tricky over the last few days. Okay, let's have a... Oh, 
quick look around to see if we can see little Shongi there somewhere. I can't, unfortunately. She could be anywhere around us. Uh, have you seen Kuli yet? Straight through this thicket. There's Karula, she's right in there. And you can see that camouflage at work. Yeah, I'm just gonna move, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just gonna move the car slightly. There we go. Oh, sister came and tried to steal the scrub here. And he's moved, so I'm just gonna try and move a little bit so we can maybe see both of them. So he's trying to keep his little kill away from his sister. He's coming up towards him. So his sister was in the drainage line just below him. And he's watching her intently. That's my scrub hair. Or my half a scrub hair. He might come join Karula. There we go. How's that, Chandra? Look at that. Isn't this amazing? Now, wouldn't it be even more... F oh, that's okay, madam. Wouldn't it be amazing if Shungile decided to try to steal it? Okay, we're just going to pull the handbrake up so we don't roll around. Now watch, he keeps looking over his back and checking for... There we go, see where he looks back? That's where I had a brief visual of his sister. Hopefully she comes out to join as well. Now Karula is looking a little bit grumpy this morning. She's hissing a little bit and that could be, she's a bit irritated by the presence of the male in the area, uh, I'm not sure. So what I am going to do is, if she is feeling a little bit uncomfortable and snarling a bit, I'm going to make move a bit further away from her. We obviously don't want to upset the queen. And you must remember, like people, animals also have bad days. They could be grumpy. So sorry, Jean, I'm going to have to move. I'm just going to move away from her a little bit, give her a little bit more space, make her feel a bit more comfortable. So it's very important because we do spend so much time with the Queen of Juma that if she is in a slightly bad mood, she might have had a bad night, she might have had an altercation with the male, if she is showing those little bit of signs of aggression, it's always better to just move away and give her a little bit more space. So we're just going to do that. Hopefully she's going to relax down a little bit from here. I know we don't have the best view of little Hosanna from here, but she was snarling and then immediately now we've moved a little bit further away. Uh, she's stopped and she seems a lot more relaxed. So, and every time you go into a sighting is different. So you can't read every sighting the same. And there we go. She's still, there we go, you see that? I think she must have had an altercation or or maybe the cubs are annoying her, or maybe there's just too many biting flies. Oh, actually now looking at her, I think it's the cubs. Because she's snarling as she walks closer to us, so it's not us. But it's better to err on the side of caution with big cats. Okay, so... It Justin said, he's never seen crew like this. Fascinating change in behavior from the queen. Now, she's smelling where that scrub hair was. So what I think, actually, it's, I think she's just a bit annoyed with the cubs. And as soon as he came closer to her, oh, she's licking the blood from the scrub hair, she started snarling. And I just wasn't sure whether it was because of us. Oh, she's got eating the, the stomach contents of the scrub hair. So I wasn't sure whether it was because of us. That's why I moved a little bit further away. But now we can see it's actually she's irritated with her own children and she's not snarling at us. But 
just in case she was, that's why I moved a little bit further away, to just give her enough space if it was us to feel comfortable again. Um, she's very close, Rane, and she's being a bit snarly, so unfortunately I'm going to stay where I am. So she's very, very close to us. She's no more than about seven or eight feet. And that's not uncommon with Karula. But if she is in a bad mood, just if she wants to come closer to us, that's fine. But we're not going to go closer to her. Very interesting. So young Hasana decided he's quite fussy. He doesn't want to eat uh, the stomach of the little scrub here. But Queen Kula, even though she's got an impala across the way, has decided she will. Not all of it. Listen to that, she's chuffing. It's calling the cub, or reprimanding the cub. And we can't be sure till we speak. Uh, I can't speak leopard. Chuff, chuff. Dina says she wonders if she's taking away the evidence of that scrub hair kill. I don't think so, Dina. I just think she's she's eating around the collar of the stomach, so she could be eating the heart, uh, the lungs, and it's maybe some tasty choice tidbits. I don't think so, Dina. I just think she's she's eating around the collar of the stomach, so she could be eating the heart, uh, the lungs, and it's maybe some tasty choice tidbits. Now, a little kill like a scrub here. <laughs> so, yeah, a, little, a little kill like a scrub here is not going to leave any, any stuff that other predators are really going to pick up on. Uh, Safari Dean's being quite, quite funny. He says, well, maybe Krula just doesn't like hipsters. <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, really joking. Sorry, I'll just be on the radio for a second. Oh, look at that. It's a little bit difficult. Um, you one vehicle for, for the moment. I'll move quite shortly, then I'll drop a branch on Ledwood for you. No, we, uh, no, no problem at all. Uh, just keep making your way. Uh, but there's only space for one vehicle to have a nice sighting. Look at that. Sorry about that. Some mysterious Kremlin found us. Sorry about that everybody, well at least you've got an incredible sighting, two cubs and mother and uh, well a whole lot of lion cubs and a whole lot of lions today, a bumper morning I'd say. We're heading on to quarantine clearings, uh, Viam and I kind of assumed we were going to have an early breakfast given that Brent was going to be with the leopards until the end of the drive but uh, we'll do a lap of quarantine and see what's there for the last few minutes. Oh, we might also show you Jamie Patterson, who's also uh, off to uh, an early breakfast. Morning, Jamie. There we go. <laughs> she, she will not be happy with me when we get back to breakfast. <laughs> now, we have an intern with us at the moment whose name is Nicholas. 
and Nicholas has been tasked apparently to paint the trees on quarantine clearings with some kind of solution uh, to stop the elephants pushing them over. It'll be very interesting to see if that actually works or not. That's of course because we don't want it to become quarantine desert. It's quite nice having quarantine parkland. All right, Brent is back online. We're going to say goodbye for the morning and we'll see you this afternoon. Thank you, Vim. Good job today. And thank you to all of you for joining us. And we'll hand you back to Brent and see you later. Oh, we're trying to get you a view of little Hassana who's moved the kill towards us. I think I'm going to go backwards a little bit. And uh, Karula's bad temperament is definitely caused by her children because as soon as he came closer, she started smiling directly at him. And we're back again. Sorry about that. We were going to have our second early breakfast and now we're not anymore. <laughs> Kirsten, I need to plan my route. How much time have we got? I was about to pull into the DRC. Lucky we didn't. Ooh. There's another woodpecker. In fact, there's a whole bird party going on here. Do not groan at me, VM. There. Listen, it's calling. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know which one that was. Hang on a second, let me play it. So there's some starlings there, there's some drongos, that's the starling you're looking at now. And I saw a, an, what looked like an orange-breasted bush shrike also flowing past there. I just want to quickly pay, play the uh, woodpecker call. I think it may have been bearded. But as I say that, I think I might be wrong. Here's the bearded. Let's listen. Absolutely was not a bearded. Let's play the cardinal. Oh, it wasn't a cardinal either. That's interesting. Let's go. We only have two others. We have the bennets and the golden tailed. And the golden tailed goes... <coughs> Maybe it's got another call. That's it. Which means it could only have been a Bennett's. But I didn't think the Bennett's was found in trees like that. It was the Bennett's. That's really nice. That's very uncommon here. Oh, and there's some hoopoos there. All right, we're going to say goodbye again. I'm probably not going to go home just yet. Brent is back online and he's with Karula. Okay, hopefully we don't move and we're able to stay with these incredible leopards. And there we go. Young Hosanna is making very short work of that scrub hair. Yum, yum, yum. Rabbit for breakfast. Of course, it's not really a rabbit. It is a hare. I suppose we could call it a bunny. So Karula is in, continuing with her incredible hunting powers and I mean she's had two adult impala in, in the last three days. It's incredible and they're finishing them so quickly with these little cubs growing. Oh. oh. Now the one thing is a little bit worrying is that this kill is on the ground, that impala kill. It hasn't been hoisted. And what has she noticed? She's noticed something. Don't think it's the arrow marked babblers calling on the other side. She might have just heard something, maybe another herd of impala moving in. So we're just going to extend for a few seconds ah, and to make sure she hasn't seen anything, but it doesn't look like she has. <coughs> so we will definitely be here on the sunset safari. <clears throat> excuse me, to 
have some more time with Queen Karula and her cubs. And this isn't this absolutely fascinating. It looks like Hassana has made his first kill at under six months. So from myself, jean -Ray, the rest of the Safari Live team, we'll see you in a couple of hours for a show full of lions and leopards.